Hey guys, this is Nick. Welcome to Strange Spotting, a place for anyone with an inquisitive mind and an insatiable curiosity for all the mystery and terror our strange world has to offer. With today's video, I'm happy to introduce the true crime segment of the channel. We will venture into an old, unsolved crime that echoes in our current times, forever inspired a cornerstone of modern television, the murder of Hazel Drew. I really hope you will enjoy this video as much, or even more, than I did making it. Something that always gives me pause is how fragile, in my opinion at least, is the collective memory regarding events. We are all familiar with the motto that says we should live in the moment, but from a general perspective, that's exactly what humanity does. We collectively focus on trendy topics. The same can be applied to unsolved murders. The case I'd like to tell you about today would have been lost in the sense of time if it weren't for Mark Frost, co-creator with David Lynch of the acclaimed show Twin Peaks, the screenwriter and producer used to spend the summers at his grandmother's place in Taberton, a hamlet in the town of Sand Lake, New York. The old lady would tell her grandchildren, as a cautionary tale against wandering alone after dark, about a woman murdered at the beginning of the 20th century in that very area. That girl became Frost's inspiration for the tragic character of Laura Palmer, whose homicide sets in motion the events of Twin Peaks. If it weren't for the screenwriter mentioning Hazel Drew's cold case as the inception of his creation, it's very possible that nobody would remember it today. Hazel Irene Drew was born in 1888 in Postenkill, two miles from Sand Lake, and had worked in Troy since the age of 14 as a domestic servant for several influential local families. During the last days of her life, she was still working for Mr. and Mrs. Gary, who had a very high opinion of her, but after a trip to New York, she abruptly resigned. On the morning of July 7, 1908, she was seen at the Troy Union Station between 11.20 and 11.30. She was carrying a suitcase and according to a witness, it seems she was expecting someone. That same witness, who happened to be an acquaintance, asked her where she was going, to which she elusively replied, down the river. She later checked her suitcase in a deposit and was seen catching a train to Albany, New York. On the evening of that same day, she was seen picking berries on Tuberton Road in Sand Lake, on the side of Tuberton Mountain, by Henry Rollman and wife, who didn't know her, but were later confirmed as the last ones to see her alive. Four days later, her body was discovered face down in Teal's Pond, very close to the spot where the Rollmans had seen her. Due to the water altering her features beyond recognition, she could only be identified through the gold fillings in her teeth and by her clothes, the same she was wearing on July 7th. The cause of death was ruled to be a blow to the back of the head with a blunt, unknown weapon that crushed her skull. There have, sadly and regrettably, been many, many unsolved murders of young women in recent history, but this one in particular inspired the character of Laura Palmer for a specific reason. Much like the Twin Peaks protagonist, Hazel, while considered the typical small-town beauty, and desired by many, apparently lived a straight-laced life. Her family insisted that she had no known sweetheart, but when the police started investigating, they discovered many hidden flings, love affairs, and unsuspected acquaintances. Hazel's life turned out to be really full of secrets, many of which the police got a hold of through several letters and postcards she kept in a trunk in her house and that would later become the inspiration for Laura Palmer's diary. It's only natural that the investigators, led by District Attorney Jarvis O'Brien, picked their suspects among Hazel's dalliances and admirers, 
And the first was Frank Smith, a farmhand who had a crush on her and had apparently seen her shortly before her murder. He gave contradictory statements to the police, but his alibi checked out and the police let him go. He was the inspiration for the character of James Hurley. Later, the police turned their gaze towards Hazel's eccentric uncle, William Taylor, who owned a farm located a mile away from Teal's Pond and had striking similarities to Dr. Jacoby, then a dentist who had proposed to her, and last, Henry Cramroth, a shady Albany millionaire who ran a nearby resort rumored to host orgies and hold women captive in the resort's basement, clearly an inspiration for the character of Benjamin Horn. Despite the case becoming a media sensation back in the day, many details seem to point to the investigation having been handled hastily and poorly. Around 20 different suspects were considered, but no one was ever charged and prosecuted. It seems somehow that in a historical period characterized by sexist and Puritan views, a case led only by men and involving a promiscuous woman was not deemed worthy of serious police effort. There is also the possibility that men with enough political and economic pull were involved and lobbied to have the investigation dropped. Many theories, obviously, have been put forward regarding Hazel's murder. Before talking about the candidates, let's take a look at some key secrets and events in her life that emerged during and after the investigation. Number one, the upper class. Hazel left her family when she was 14 years old and had worked for some of the wealthiest families in Troy as a domestic servant. Troy was a Republican Party stronghold and was bustling with business opportunities. So much, in fact, that thousands of women, according to historians, were coming from uh, nearby towns to work in factories and as domestic collaborators. Two, according to Carrie Weaver, her best friend, she had been on a trip to New York and she was planning to move there since she had abruptly resigned from her job at the time and had packed quite a few items in her suitcase. Number three, money. Hazel had suddenly changed her spending patterns and was buying clothes and objects she could not afford with her pay as domestic servant. It's not too much of a stretch to assume she had become the secret lover of a man of means. In fact, there were six letters in her trunk written by someone whose only signature was CES, sent to Hazel from New York and Boston, the two cities she had recently visited. In one of them, he wrote, Your merry smile and twinkling eyes torture me. Your face haunts me. Why can I be contented again? You have stolen my liberty. Please, don't forget a promise to write. When I reach Albany again, I will meet you at the tavern. I must see you soon, or I'll die of starvation. Number four, suitors. We know she had many secret admirers and quite possibly uh, some sexual flings, but when interviewed by the police, both her mother and her best friend, Carrie Weaver, insisted that she didn't have a boyfriend or fiancé. It was also discovered that she had a secret abortion sometime before her death. This is not a certainty, but too many details point in this direction. Due to an undisclosed illness she said she had to recover from, she went to stay with her uncle and aunt, William and Minnie Taylor, on their farm near Teal's Pond for three weeks. And her aunt had procured her some anti-pregnancy pills. It was also discovered that Minnie Taylor, whom she had worked with for some prominent families, asked one of Hazel's friends to destroy the correspondence she had with her niece. Number five, the witness who talked to her at Troy Station said she was expecting someone, and all seems to point to July 7th being the day she was leaving for good. The discrepancy and contentious point is that she did not leave right away, but went to Sand Lake. Something that emerged during the police interviews is that she was very fond of her younger brother, Willie Drew, who was working for a farm in Taberton owned and operated by Mrs. Libby Sowalski, a widow, and her son, Michael. 
Willis said during his own interrogation with the police that Hazel didn't know anyone in Taberton and that she was most certainly coming to say goodbye to him. Now, a video about this case would not be complete without mentioning a book of great success written by David Bushman and Mark T. Gibbons and published in 2022, Murder at Teal's Pond. The authors wrote it after five years spent interviewing descendants of Sand Lake residents and researching local libraries. I both applaud their painstaking work of unearthing key facts about Hazel's life and investigation, and I encourage you to buy and read the book to dive into this mysterious story and to be inspired by how real sleuth work should be done. Before I give you my whodunit hypothesis, which differs from theirs. I must warn you that even though their conclusion is only a few clicks away on Google, I still consider what I'm about to tell you spoilers. And you should pause and forward to the time impression in case you want to read the book first. All right, in Matter at Teal's Pond, Bushman and Gibbons conclude that Hazel was killed by two prominent Republican politicians from Troy, William Cushing and Fred Schatzel. The main facts they cite as corroborating their hypothesis are William Cushing and Fred Schatzel were spotted on a carriage by a couple riding another carriage, the Hoffays. The police identified them thanks to the Hoffays' description, who said the man driving, Cushing, looked away, clearly trying to hide his face. They also said the carriage looked out of place, luxurious and custom-made, a clear indication that it belonged to, in their own words, city folk. They also noticed, moments later, a third person standing among the trees, very close to where Hazel's body would later be found. The police never showed the Hofe couple pictures of Cushing and Schatzel. They were never charged, and the police, who also had ties with the Republican Party, dropped the investigation immediately after. The authors formulate the hypothesis that, while working for rich and important families in Troy, she must have either become the lover of William Cushing or must have heard or seen things that could compromise both men's careers, as well as the interests of the local Republican Party's precinct. This prompted Cushing and Schatzel to reach her on a carriage and kill her. This theory, of course, holds quite a bit of water, but there are a few things that don't sit quite right with me. If Hazel was privy to their dirty laundry, so to speak, or had become an inconvenient present for Cushing who wanted to stop the affair, why planning to murder her in Sand Lake? Maybe I watched too many movies, but I think a premeditated murder would have involved getting rid of the body in a less conspicuous place. They also had no reason to go to Taberton Road to kill her. Which leads me to the third inconsistency. How did they know where to find her in the first place? Last, but absolutely not least, why was there a third man next to the pond? If he was an associate of uh, Cushing and Schatzel who participated in the murder, I don't see why they would leave with the carriage without him. I did not devote as much time and effort as the previously mentioned authors to dig into this century-old cold case, and I don't presume my theory to be better than theirs, but I want to give you my two cents nonetheless. First and foremost, it seems to me this was a case of people trying to cover their tracks to protect their reputation and interests. But this doesn't necessarily equate with murdering a 20 years old girl. Many aspects of this case make me think this was a crime of passion. There is one overlooked detail in the story. When Willie Drew, Hazel's brother, was interviewed by the police, he painted Michael Sowalski, co-owner with his mother of the farm where Willie was working and staying and Hazel was headed to the night she was killed, in a very negative light. When asked about Michael, he said he was big and naughty and that he was known to perform cruel acts on animals. The muscular young man was considered to be lacking in intelligence, and when interrogated by the police, he came up with an alibi and was therefore not considered a possible culprit. But what if he was lying? He was 20 years old, the same age as Hazel, 
and they most definitely knew each other. They quite possibly had known each other since childhood, having grown up in the same small town and in similar social conditions. In those times, the term serial killer had not yet been invented, and psychiatric conditions such as psychopathy and narcissism had not yet been discovered and studied. But this cannot stop us from considering that detail about animal cruelty as a potential clue about Michael Sowalski's capacity for murder. We know that another boy, Frank Smith, a friend of Sowalski, was considered a suspect. But in such a small town, a stunning beauty like Hazel's is sure to have made her the object of many boys' desires. This is my theory of how things played out. Many people were in love with Hazel, that much we know. While some did make a move on her, like the dentist who proposed to her and possibly Frank Smith, Michael Sowalski probably managed to have intimate relations with her and was possibly responsible for Hazel's unwanted pregnancy. Hazel's aunt, Minnie Taylor, helped her with that problem, but had nothing to do with the murder. She only asked Hazel's friend to destroy the correspondence because, in a small town like Sand Lake, her reputation would have been destroyed for being involved with an abortion. Thanks to her work in Troy, Hazel started hanging out in the same venues as the elite, specifically the tavern mentioned in the letters. That's where she met CES who was most likely a Republican politician from New York, but in a higher ranking position than Cushing and Schetzel, who introduced the two. CES, already married and with a family, started a clandestine relationship with Hazel and arranged for her to visit him in New York. When over there, he promised her she could be his mistress and would provide for her financial needs if she moved to New York. Hazel, infatuated with the wealthy lifestyles she had witnessed thanks to her job, was delighted at the opportunity to distance herself from her humble origins and live a better life, and agreed to his proposal. On July 7th, they were supposed to meet at Troy Station and leave together for Albany, which was her original destination, and probably spend time with him during some political convention. CES did meet her there, but told her he had some unforeseen matters to attend to for that day, and they would meet in Troy that night and leave together the day after. Hazel replied to him that she would take the chance to say goodbye to her beloved brother in Sand Lake on Taberton Road. CES told her he would send his associates Cushing and Schatzel to pick her up later in the afternoon in a carriage and bring her back to him. At this point, Hazel took a different train. She arrived in Sand Lake and waited for her brother to finish working at the farm. Right after being spotted by the Romans, she was intercepted by Michael Sowalski, who asked what she was doing there. She told him she had fallen in love with a man and was moving to New York to be with him. Michael was jealous and said her place was in Sand Lake with him. Perhaps he insulted her, calling her a prostitute. Hazel scoffed at him in retort, making him feel inferior to the man who was going to provide for her. Michael could not control the emotions stemming from his wounded ego and hit her repeatedly. She tried to escape, but he would not let her, and in a fit of rage, he hit her on the head. Realizing she was dead, the only thing he could come up with was throwing her body in the pond. He heard the noise of a carriage, the one Cushing and Schatzel were riding, and took cover. The two men covered Taberton Road, forth and back, but with no sign of Hazel, they decided to go back to Troy, crossing path with a Hoffes, who saw them and spotted the silhouette of Michael Sowalski, who got up and left. Later on, when Hazel's body was found and the police interrogated Cushing and Schatzel, they realized that uh, CS reputation was too important to be associated with that murder, even if his only sin was adultery, and they chose to drop the investigation. That's it for today, guys. Please share your thoughts and ideas in the comments. I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, make sure to like it and subscribe to Strange Spotting for more content like this. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.